Okay, hello everyone. Uh, today uh, is MedLife 2021, uh, hosted by CamWams. So we see <clears throat> a couple of people still trickling in, and we'll let that happen uh, throughout the course of the afternoon. But welcome everybody who's decided to sign up. It's a Saturday afternoon, and hopefully you'll get some usefulness and enjoyment out of this conference uh, this afternoon. Okay, so just before we start, uh, You've all been sent a student code of conduct, uh, essentially just to make sure that uh, you don't want to send any rude questions or um, you don't want to uh, be recording this event. We are going to be distributing the recording at some point later, and we'll tell you a little bit about that towards the end of the conference. Uh, but breach of this code of conduct will result in your removal from the conference. So please make sure you have a little read of that before uh, coming into the conference. Thank you. So uh, just before we start with the conference proper, just wanted to talk a little bit about Cambridge WAM. So Cambridge, uh, CAMWAM stands for Cambridge Wiring Access to Medicine. Here are our lovely committee members. Um, our general aim is to make uh, medicine as accessible as possible to disadvantaged students. So we run conferences and webinars just like this, uh, interview workshops, and we collate resources online uh, for people to be able to use. Uh, one of those websites that we use is camwams.co.uk. You might have actually signed up through there. Um, so have a look at that. We've got some resources. That's where we post our events. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about our newsletters and mentor mentorships in a minute, and also our contact page. So if you have any specific questions, so if you have any questions that you don't want to ask here at this conference, but instead later, you can press the contact button um, and we'll be able to uh, send an email to you answering your questions there. In your newsletter, in the newsletter section, we also have our, our archive of newsletters. You can also sign up to our newsletter there. It's a great resource. We have uh, interview questions and how we might answer them. We also have links of the day, so news articles about uh, some things related to medicine that might be asked uh, during an interview. So please do have a look at it. Consider signing up. Uh, it's really a helpful resource. We've also partnered up with uni admissions. So if you would like some mentorship or some tutoring related to the medical school applications, whether that's within Cambridge or uh, outside of Cambridge, we've partnered up with them. Uh, please go onto our website if you're interested. Uh, you should be able to be linked up with uh, one of the Cambridge medical students. So you can get more help in terms of personal statements, interviews, things of that sort. Social media, we have our Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook page. Please do like uh, and follow these pages uh, so you can get up to date on our latest news and events, and you can get signed up quite quickly there. Okay, so today's schedule, uh, we have a packed day uh, for the next three and a half hours. Uh, so please do have a look at what the schedule is. You should have been sent an email with the schedule as well. Um, just a reminder, Q&A section, there should be a button at the bottom saying your Q&A. So please click on that, send us a question, and we'll be able to um, answer those questions in specific Q&A parts. Uh, this will be recorded. Um, so please don't worry if you can't make the entire thing. OK. Um, and don't worry about the Q&A being dis dismissed, because we're just making sure that we're sending them the right answers to the question. OK. And other things to do, just follow us on our Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and check out our website. Okay, let's start our conference proper. So unfortunately, um, Dr. Paul Wilkinson, who is the Dean, was unable to come because he was in a, a biking accident. But we've got the amazing, amazing Dr. Fiona Cook, who is just as lovely and just as uh, wonderful. Um, and she's going to be talking a little bit about why Cambridge, some tips that she has. And luckily, she's actually from a, a disadvantaged background. She came from a state school, so she's got um, immense experience on this. And she's on a sub dean. She's now a sub dean at Cambridge. So, you know, going from uh, where you guys might be all the way up to the top. So over to you, Dr. Cook. Fantastic. Thank you for that introduction, Mackie. I'm absolutely delighted to be here. It's fantastic. There are so many of you here as well. Um, 
and I'm going to say a little bit of an introduction about myself and some of my experience, hopefully give you some top tips um, about whether to apply for medicine, if so, whether to apply for Cambridge and how we can help you with that. So I'm going to share my screen, if you'll just bear with me a second. There we are. So as Mackie said, I'm a sub-dean at the University of Cambridge School of Medicine. Um, when I wondered about applying to medicine, I'm not sure I ever thought I would ever go to Cambridge, let alone um, be back here as a consultant at Addenbrooke's Hospital, which is where I am this afternoon. Um, hence, excuse the messy background um, and talking to you about applying. So I thought I'd say a little bit about myself. Uh, as Mackie said, I was state school educated in Nottingham. Nottingham's a funny place. People in the north think it's in the south and people in the south think it's in the north. But there we go. Um, neither of my parents went to university. My father left school at 16. My mum went to um, teacher training college and was a primary school teacher. Um, but when I was wondering after I did my um, exams about a which A-levels to do and where to go. Um, there was somebody at my comprehensive in Nottingham who'd been to Girton to do biology. Um, and I wondered, I quite like biology, I quite like sciences. And then um, I was at a careers evening and somebody said, well, why don't you think about medicine? And to cut a very long story short, I applied to Girton because I knew someone who'd been there. I was accepted and I did three years here in Cambridge. At that time, you could um, rather than not everybody could stay at Adam Brooks. So I went to do um, my three years of clinical studies in Oxford. Um, and then I got a Bachelor of Medicine and Bachelor of Science. Um, and I also met my husband. So that has to be a big plus point. Um, I've put my line of degrees at the bottom, not to show off or anything like that, but really just to um, sort of illustrate the fact that, you know, when I was 16, I didn't really know whether I, what I wanted to do, where I wanted to go. Um, but, you know, um, I've worked hard over the years. I've had lots of opportunities. I've taken those opportunities when I've been able to. I now have a Master of Arts, a PhD. So I did a three year of lab based uh, research on genomics. So sequencing salmonella infections. I did an MSc, so a Master of Science in Microbiology. I'm a fellow of the Royal College of Physicians. I'm a fellow of the Royal College of Pathologists. And I spent a wonderful six months at the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine doing a diploma in tropical medicine and hygiene. So you'll see there's a whole host of things open to you uh, above and beyond your medical degree. Whoopsie. So now, um, as I've said, I work at Adam Brooks Hospital here in, here in Cambridge, and my main job is a consultant microbiologist. Um, so as my children say, I, um, I do biology of little things. Um, I am really bridging the gap between the laboratory where the biomedical scientists help diagnose infections um, and the wards. Um, and I also play a major role in antibiotic stewardship um, and infection control, which of course over the last uh, 18 months or so with the COVID pandemic has just been astronomical really. Um, as was mentioned, I'm a sub-dean at the clinical school here in Cambridge. I have a number of other regional and national roles. I'm an examiner uh, for the Royal College of Pathologists and I'm involved in various other initiatives. Um, and I've been a fellow, which is kind of like a teacher or a Don in the old language um, at Girton College uh, for the last uh, 17 years, which is a bit odd, I have to say, when I was a student there. Uh, but there we go. At Girton, until 18 months ago, I was a director of studies, which means I have academic overview of uh, both preclinical and clinical students. Um, and I've interviewed for medicine since 2003, which I'm not going to ask you your dates of birth, but it's a very long time. I know you're going to have some interview workshops later on, and I'll say a little bit about interviews too. Um, but I'm so lucky that I have a job that I love, uh, a job that's interesting, a job that's fascinating. I work with great teams. I work with great colleagues. Um, a fan fantastic group of medical students, such as the ones uh, who've put together this afternoon's conference for you, which I think is great. Um, but I'm really passionate, not just about clinical medicine, but about access to the medical course. So I guess my first question is, do you think you might want to be a doctor? Um, anybody who's... Uh, <laughs> 
uh, not had their head in the sand for the eight, last 18 months or so, we know how hard work it is. Without a doubt, you've got to like working hard, but it's extremely rewarding, both at an individual patient level and also at the population level. I think you need to have a sound scientific understanding. I think unless you really love science, um, you'll struggle with a medical course. And I guess one of my overall messages for the, for the afternoon is do something that you like because that will make you happy and you're more likely to do well at it. So if you're not really that keen on science, then probably you need to think about other alternative rewarding professions of which there are um, a, a huge number. Um, as you know, medicine's all about applying that science with the human interactions. Um, without a doubt, it's lifelong learning. I took my last exam when I was 36. So after I qualified, because I had a gap year where I worked as a volunteer overseas, and then I came to Cambridge and Oxford, which makes it a six year course rather than a five year course, which a lot of universities have, you know, I was still taking exams for 11 years after I qualified. So you think medicine, medical school is a long time, but to do exams um, for a decade afterwards, I think is um, uh, proves uh, that you've got to be somebody who doesn't mind working hard and revising and learning your stuff. Um, we have a saying at work, the only constant thing is change, and certainly everything's changed uh, in the whole world since COVID came along. I supervise, um, which means I give small group teaching sessions to medical students on pathology, um, which we call biology of disease or BOD. So you'll see there are all sorts of Cambridge names for uh, normal things, really. Um, and until two years ago, we kind of touched on the word pandemic. We talked about epidemics. We talked about endemic diseases. We mentioned coronavirus a little bit, but nobody had even heard of SARS-CoV-2. So I think that just illustrates, you know, how things are changing. Um, and hopefully you've already got the message that I think it's a hugely satisfying job on many levels. There's a wide variety of career opportunities. I think when I was in sixth form, I thought you could either be a GP or you could be a hospital consultant, um, and that was probably it. But actually, with uh, if you call it, if you decide to do medicine and you qualify as a doctor, the world is your oyster in terms of what you can do. Some people do opt for pure research degrees, sorry, pure research careers, um, and they make a huge difference to. Uh, patients on the population level. You might decide you want to go into medical policy, medical journalism, work for a, a pharmaceutical company in drug development. Um, there are plenty of medics in the armed forces. Uh, lots of people work abroad, some for a shorter period of time. So I actually went as a, a medical doctor on an expedition to Arctic Greenland. Um, and an expedition to Alaska, which was great fun. Uh, you might even be the next Van Tulliken twin, who knows, um, and make it as a medical TV or radio star. So that's not an um, a, a, a all-inclusive list. It's just to show that there are a huge variety of things uh, you can do. It's not just about being a GP or a hospital consultant, although those are the main things. So if you think you might want to be a doctor, how on earth do you find out? I guess you ask yourself the question, as I've uh, mentioned earlier, do you really like science? In fact, do you love science? Do you like people? Do you like teamwork? Um, there are some people who qualify as doctors and then, as I've said, go into pure research degrees. But even if you're doing research um, in a laboratory, you've still got to like working with people. And I think above all, and what we really try to tease out at interview is, are you committed to this? Are you motivated? Can you hack the long demanding course of five to six years study? And then what comes after that? Um, and probably, you know, other than trying to think about it yourself, you might want to talk to your family, you talk to your teachers, talk to, you know, friends in your community and just sort of gauge what their reaction like might be. Um, and hopefully that will help you try to make up your mind. Another thing that I think is really important in trying in terms of trying to work out whether you want to be a doctor or not is some work experience and I've put it in capital letters because as I say I think it's really important not just for your personal statement which is why a lot of you think oh I better do some work experience or your teacher says well what have you got to put on your personal statement but actually it's really important for you to try and work out whether this might suit you for the rest of your life. Um, 
Now, work experience can be tricky. Uh, in the COVID pandemic, it's been particularly difficult. But something I want to emphasize you, to you is it really doesn't matter what you do as long as it's something to do with healthcare. So I speak to a lot of people and they go, oh, but there are no doctors in my family. Um, you know, and I can't go to my local GP because of confidentiality issues. They don't want me sitting with them. I was in exactly the same boat. I remember going to the pharmacy as a volunteer and they let me stand behind the counter. And it wasn't actually about learning a, which drug you give for which thing. It was more to see what sort of um, ailments and issues people come to the pharmacist about. I also went with a health visitor. I didn't really know what health visitors were and what they did, but it was all about weighing babies babies and checking mums were okay and coping with uh, newborns but if you can go with any sort of midwife or physios or dietitians or district nurses I think that would help see what sort of thing um, you can do as a doctor who you might work with and then hopefully when you're stuck writing an essay at one o'clock in the morning about some bizarre chemical cycle for your biochemistry you'll think actually I do need to do this because this is all about going to be a doctor and helping patients. Um, I'm a firm believer that as well as some sort of snapshot work experience, it's really valuable to you and to the people you visit if you can do some sort of regular volunteering, whether that's an old people's home, working with disabled children. I know people, students who horse ride, so they've done horse riding for the disabled. You know, it might be to do with your interests. It might be totally non-glamorous and that really doesn't matter. It's to try and work out whether you think this is the sort of environment and the sort of work um, that might suit you. Um, I'm just going to tell you a quick story because we started a few minutes early. Um, a friend of mine from Cambridge, her son was thinking about doing medicine and she's an engineer. Um, and her husband's an engineer and she said oh you know what shall he do so I said well come and stay with us for a week and he can come to the hospital with me he did some intensive care he did some um, accident and emergency he did what's called bronchoscopy which is when you have a telescope into your lungs to try and see what's wrong with your lungs he scanned babies he talked to people about drug development essentially he did you know a different morning or an afternoon for the week and this guy really loved it he went home on an absolute high saying he'd had the best week of his life ever and then his mum said to me oh now what has he got to do next I said you know I'm really glad he had a good time he's got to go to some sort of care home and uh, chat to people see what it's like with pe working with people who've got dementia maybe play bingo with them make them cups of tea anyway it's a long story and you can probably guess what's going to what I'm going to say next but he absolutely hated it and he really then questioned what he liked about his week in the hospital. And actually it's the technical side of things that really appealed to him. He's not a particular sort of people's person. Um, and funnily enough, he actually went off to do engineering at Bristol and he's really happy. So um, it doesn't matter what you do, um, it's thinking what might interest you and what you might like to go on to study. Um, another example I sometimes give, you know, it doesn't matter if your father is a cardiothoracic surgeon and does heart transplants and you go and see the most, you know, technical, uh, most recent operation, but you don't know why the patient needed a heart transplant and what difference it makes to their life, then that's not really what we're looking for. You know, whereas somebody who's played bingo with old ladies, who's been with a health visitor, um, who's uh, done district nurse visits, helped drag, dress leg ulcers, but really thinks about it and knows what it's like for the patients, um, to me, shows a lot more commitment and understanding than, as I say, you know, people who've seen uh, hip replacements or really um, hot off the press surgery. So think about what you do. Um, and I'm sorry I've spoken so long about work experience, but I do think it's important to do some and to reflect on it going to go a bit quicker now. If you think you might want to do medicine, is the Cambridge course for you? 
Um, some of this applies to Oxford as well. Without a doubt, it's very scientific. It's very demanding. You do write lots of essays. You'll be writing essays about the knee joint. You'll be writing essays about metabolism, things that you wouldn't believe you can write essays about. And not everything you study will seem relevant at all. Um, your lectures will be in the departments in town, whereas your supervisions or small group tutorials will be within your college. Um, there are a couple of relatively recent initiatives where you do see a couple of patients in your first three years, but really you're not on the wards until year four. If you think you're more of a people person, um, there are lots of medical students, well, medical schools where you start on the wards at the beginning. And actually that might be better suited to you. Some places do the system approach. So you'll go to a ward and see patients who've had a heart attack. You'll learn about the pathology of heart attacks. You'll learn about the anatomy of the coronary arteries. You'll learn about the drugs that treat heart attacks. Um, and actually that might be better for you rather than the three years of science and the three years of clinical. Um, you're going to hear a lot this afternoon about applying and getting in. Um, the, what I want to emphasize is that we really try and put everything into context. It's not just based on one thing. So we're looking at your GCSE results and your A-levels if you've already taken them and you're applying post A-level or your predicted A-level grades. Of course, your school references, your personal statement, which I know you're going to hear about more later, the BMAT or biomedical admissions test that you will need to take. Um, we do uh, have a put a strong weighting on interviews, um, but what we really want to do is to put everything into the context of you as an individual. So we want to see the sorts of opportunities that you've had, the sorts of opportunities you've taken. We know that things can happen. We know I, when I was doing maths at school, my maths, my further maths teacher um, was ill and we couldn't find a replacement and nobody else could do pure maths. You know, so we want to know about that sort of thing because that's nobody's fault. That's just something that happens, unfortunately. You know, uh, there will be people who are ill or have family illness. Um, and we don't want that to stop us uh, losing a really good candidate um, because without a doubt, uh, we want the best people who apply here to be accepted. Um, just a little bit about interviews. It's really important to prepare for interviews. That won't come as a surprise to you. I suggest you practice with people you don't know. If you practice with your teachers at school who think you're great anyway, it's unlikely that they're really going to stretch you. Um, but don't practice too much because it comes across um, as very polished if you've had lots and lots of interviews and you might not sound as spontaneous um, as would be good. Try and think about everything you've written in your personal statement. Um, everything's got to be true. Don't write about something that you think you might do as though you've done it because we might find you out as we have done in the past. Obvious things that if you say you like reading medical books um, and I ask the question, which book have you read recently? Then I don't um, expect you to say, well, I've been studying so hard. I haven't had time to read because, you know, in terms of work life balance and in terms of supporting what you say on your personal statement, that's great. Um, also think about your current A level topics, because that can be um, a nice opening interview. You know, what are you doing in chemistry at the moment and why does it fascinate you type things? Think about your current the current medical issues going on. Everybody can look at the newspapers, look at the BBC website. You might want to think about um, New Scientists or some other scientific journals. But actually, a lot of this you should be doing anyway. You know, if you're curious, if you think you want to do medicine, I'd hope that you're looking at the you know BBC Health and the and the um, news sites um, even before you're thinking about interviews. On the day, we do try and make you feel at ease. We know it's nerve wracking. Um, whether it's face to face or on Zoom, um, it's not an uh, environment you're really familiar with, but we're going to push you because we want to see how you think. It's not necessarily do you know the answer to this question, it's can you apply the knowledge you've already got and try and work out what might happen. So in summary, we know different six formers have different opportunities. Some people will be from medical families. Some people will be from families where nobody's been to university. And we don't want that to influence who we take. 
I use the word reflect here, um, which really means have a sit down and a cup of tea and maybe a chat to your mum or older brother or sister after you've been on work experience about what you've seen, about what you've done, about what you read in the paper. Because again, you know, you're going to have to think about some big issues through medical school. And we want to see that you're not afraid to approach some of those things. Any events you hear about, either locally or online, to do with health, some um, wherever you live, some local universities or uh, further education colleges have outreach events. Some hospitals will have lectures for the public. Um, so go along to those and see what you think. But really try and find out as much as you can to help you make the right decision. And that's the decision for you, not the decision for the other friends at school who might be thinking about medicine too. You know, this is a personal thing and it's a huge commitment without a doubt. Um, and you're lucky, you know, you've got Google, he's your best friend. Um, you can also email anybody with any question. You know, in the old days, we used to have to telephone somebody um, to ask them, you know, how you filled in this application form or what you should write in this box. Whereas now you can just email um, if you've got any queries. And I know that the CAMWAMS team will be delighted to answer any questions you might have for them. But I guess my bottom line is if you think you might like medicine and if you think the Cambridge course might make you happy, it's going to be hard, but it is hugely rewarding. It's hugely uh, varied. It's hugely satisfying. So if you think you might like it, then why not give it a go? Otherwise, I guess I was at the stage that I thought if I don't apply, I will never know. So why not try? Um, so that comes to the end of my slides. Thank you so much for listening and good luck, whatever you decide to do. Thank you.